Hello, everyone. This is Adia Zafar from HRAI, and I would like to welcome you to today's session. Our presenter, Steve Yastro, president of Yastro & Company, will discuss how you can use the concepts of brand harmony to grow your business and navigate through uncertainty. Please be advised, all the lines are muted. You will notice on the control panel of your screen a link to ask questions. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar. And now we welcome Steve Yastro. Hey, hello, everybody. Nice to see you and welcome to April of 2020. I think back to like October, November. Could you have imagined that now people would be hunkered out at home, streets would be emptying, and people and businesses are facing some incredible uncertainty? Now, when it comes to the personal side of this, you have lots of resources to help you with that. Not my specialty. Let's let other people help you with that. I can talk to you and help you with how to deal with this situation in your business. And so I want you to think about that. How do you deal with the situation in your business? Do you feel in control or do you feel a bit out of control? What I want you to think about is how you need to be in the driver's seat here. You need to sit in the driver's seat. You know, it's, um, yeah, there we go. You're gonna face lots of things that are out of your control in this situation. Of course you are. There are so many things out of your control, but you can't let those things control you. Sure, you need to assess and evaluate and understand the things that are out of your control, but your success in the situation depends largely on whether you can control the things that you can control. So think about this idea of sitting in the driver's seat, not the passenger seat. A driver has control. They can choose their destination, their route, their speed, the direction, and if they encounter a roadblock, they can navigate around it and still get to their destination. The passenger, they're just along for the ride. Yeah, you know, I, I can remember back 2009, the Great Recession was rocking our world, and I saw lots of business leaders who looked like they were in control, like drivers, but I saw many who reminded me of passengers, just like stuck in the back seat, being taken by forces out of their control to, you know, who knows where. You don't want to be like that. You want to be in control, in the driver's seat. So as we think about that, recognize that if you are in the driver's seat, you can recover before anybody else. You know, think about it. Lots of companies in your situation who have the same number of employees, same kinds of customers, you're not all gonna do the same through this economic downturn. Some are gonna do better than others. What I wanna talk to you about today are some ways that you can recover before anybody else, how you can take actions that help you not just survive, but hopefully thrive in this coming challenging time that we're into right now. One thing to recognize is that you cannot control your environment. You're gonna hear lots of things on the, no on the news about unemployment. I know Canada lost, a million Canadians lost their jobs in March, and it looks like the numbers might be even worse in April. That's pretty significant. The stock market, the company's gross domestic product, interest rates, consumer spending, you can't control these things. Yes, they affect you. Now, these are what we call macroeconomic factors. You may have heard of the term macroeconomics. Well, this is what macroeconomics is about, the things you can't control. They affect you, but you can't control them. And succeeding in a situation like this really is about how you understand the things you can't control and adapt to them. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how to understand things, and then we're gonna spend most of our time today on how you can take actions to adapt to this changing environment to help your business succeed. One thing I want you to recognize is that this idea of adapting to your environment, the secret to success in life is actually adapting to environmental conditions. And when I say this, I don't mean it like as a self-help kind of a thing, like, for those of us in the first half of the 21st century, the success in life is about adapting. I don't mean that. I mean the success of life on Earth for like the last three and a half billion years since life first appeared on this planet. When people uh, talk about the, the concept of evolution of life on Earth, they often associate it with the idea of the survival of the fittest which is usually interpreted to mean the strongest survive. You know, that the fastest cheetahs can catch the most gazelles and the fastest gazelles can get away from the most cheetahs. 
that physical fitness is what's meant by survival of the fittest, but that's really not how it works. It's really about how well you can adapt to your environmental conditions. Now, if you're a gazelle and your environment includes a lot of fast, hungry cheetahs, well then of course, being fast yourself is a way you can adapt to your environment. But what if you're a, uh, what if, imagine a species of fish who's trying to live deep down in the sea where it's really dark and they developed bioluminescence, the ability to cast light from their bodies, or humans. We've adapted to many changing environmental conditions over our history in lots of ways. One is we had, we had evolved the ability to cooperate with each other. The secret to success for life on Earth for millions of species is about how they can adapt to their environmental conditions for all species and for humans too. And we got where we are today by constantly adapting and evolving to changing conditions. And we're seeing something that's rocking our world now. We've done it, we've gotten through it many times. Here's an example. About 70,000 years ago, we humans, we almost went extinct. There was this major volcanic eruption. It was called Mount Toba. It was like in the region of Sumatra. If you remember Mount St. Helens, this was 2,800 times bigger than that. Mount Toba cast so much ash in the air, it caused what they call a volcanic winter. For like six to 10 years, there was ash in the air, which lowered temperatures. We humans lost a lot of our food supplies. And then as the ash came to the ground, they speculated it was like walking through ashtrays. That also caused a lot of changes in our habitat. We got down to about five to 10,000 human beings at that time. We barely made it. Five to 10,000 human beings on the whole planet? I mean, that's like, I mean, that's like the attendance at a bad professional hockey game. There's like nobody there, right? But we made it. A number of us adapted from that five to 10,000, and now there are seven and a half billion of us on the planet. So we have the ability to adapt to our environment. We've got it in us. All of us in this call, we're cousins who are descended from those few people who made it after the Mount Toba eruption and adapted their conditions and fought their way back. So we have it in us to do this. You see, part of adapting to our environmental conditions isn't predicting exactly what's gonna happen. We don't know exactly what's gonna happen. Look how much different the world is than it was two or three weeks ago right now. And especially from two to three months ago. However, we can be prepared for whatever might happen. You know, our world is getting rocked right now. It's totally getting rocked. And we don't know the specifics of what's gonna happen, like I've said here, but there's a few things we can speculate. You know, as the pandemic gets under control and hopefully in, a, in appropriate ways that, that don't make the public health situation worse, there will be strong forces getting people to do business again. At some point, and again, hopefully appropriately and safely, people will be in restaurants, on airplanes, procuring things for their supply chain like they were before. I don't know exactly how it's gonna play out, but I do know it's gonna be different. It's gonna be a lot different. People are gonna buy things differently. They're gonna sell things differently. They're gonna make decisions differently than they did in 2019 or the first part of 2020. It's gonna be different. And the question is, which of us will adapt to this new world, this new reality? And I'll tell you, you think about five to 10 years from now, I know that in five to 10 years, we will be reading stories about companies and people that did really well in 2020 and 2021, not because they took advantage of anyone, but because they managed to offer things of value that people cared about. And I want you to be one of those people or one of those companies that adapts to the situations we're in. And I'll tell you something, those winners, they're not waiting. They are already taking action in April. You know, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of business leaders over the past few weeks. I've had so many conversations with people and they fall into two categories. There are people who are making it happen and saying, I know there's a lot of incoming fire right now, but I have to be thinking about what to do to make my business survive. And other people are like, I can't talk about this for two months, dealing with COVID-19. I know you're dealing with it, but I'll guarantee you your competitors, Many of them are taking action now. And I wanna talk with you about the action you could be taking right now to ensure that your business will not only survive in this economic storm, but will hopefully thrive and at least do as well as you possibly can in this situation. 
So to be in the driver's seat and make things happen, what you need to do is you need to adapt to your environment with thoughtful, deliberate, and strategic action. So let's talk about this now. You know these environmental things are happening. I said you cannot control these economic fact, macroeconomic factors. None of us can change the stock market or unemployment levels, right? Um, but we can do is adapt to it, like our ancestors after the Mount Toba volcanic eruption. We can take thoughtful, deliberate, and strategic action to thrive in this situation. So to be in the driver's seat, the lens I want to share with you is what I call the brand harmony results model. And here it is here. If you look on the screen here, what you'll see is a model that shows us the connection between your employees, your customers, and your results. Now, this model I've developed over the years, and it's, it's timeless in the sense that it describes the physics of your business and how you make money. And really, what it says is that if you, the way you make money, your number one profit lever is when your employees have beliefs about your company that inspire them to take the actions that create powerful, compelling, engaging customer experiences. And if your customers have those experiences with you, they'll believe in your company. And if they believe in your company, they'll act in ways that help you succeed. This is how you make money. As I say, this is timeless, but it's also incredibly timely and in that it shows us how to adapt to this particular situation that we we're facing here in April of 2020 and all the uncertainty we're facing. Use this model as a guide to move forward. And that's what I want to show you how to do right now. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this in three areas. We're going to first talk about determining what your success looks like. Then we'll talk about how to motivate your customers to help you achieve your success. Then we'll talk about how to inspire your team. Now, all these slides will be made available to you by HR AI. And I'm also gonna give you a chance at the end to ask questions. And also I'll, I'll flash my email address up there if anybody wants to send me a question later. Because this is important stuff. I'm gonna share with you a framework, a lens to look through that will help you guide your business to be ready for whatever might happen in this uncertain situation. So let's start the right side of this model with your result. You know, let's talk about the possible results you can have. Imagine it's December 31st of 2021. You know, what's that, about 19 and a half months from now. And 20 and a half months from now, whatever, close enough. And you're looking at some reports, either printed out on a dashboard that show you how your business performed in 2020 and 2021. There are an infinite range of, of outcomes from the terrible to the amazing and everything in between. It's not predetermined. It's not been written already what those results are going to be. You get to control what they are. Let's do this. Let's imagine the best possible outcomes you could achieve. What are the best possible outcomes for your business in this new environment? Here's why I want you to do this. I mean, first of all, it feels good, of course, to think about the success you could have. But more importantly, what it does, it helps you focus because you may have more limited resources for a while. Your customers will have limited resources potentially. So how do you focus on the areas of your business that have the most potential for success so you can focus your resources in the right way? And my team and I are doing this right now. We're looking at all the different revenue streams we have in our business and things we do and saying, you know, that's going to be tough for a while. This could be good. And guess we're focusing over here. These are the customers, the clients that might be more amenable what we're doing. These are the offerings we have that are more uh, apt for this situation. I want you to do that. What kind of business, what kind of customers, what kind of products and services, what kind of whatever, whatever it might be, where are the best possible outcomes for you? And by thinking backwards from that, you'll be able to focus yourself in a really powerful way. Now let's think about what it takes to create those results. Again, think back to, or think forward to December 31st of 2021, and you're seeing these results. You've achieved your best possible outcomes. What got you there? Well, here's a way I want you to think about how you achieve your best possible outcomes and how you achieve any results in your business. I, I had this realization a number of years ago, and it was a realization that was pretty humbling, but I also think it was pretty healthy. 
I realized one day that as hard as I work in my business, I don't create my business results. My customers do. I can do all sorts of things, create, you know, write a new manuscript for a new book, create a new online program. There's a couple of things I'm doing right now, but they don't turn into money until people want to learn about them, buy them, tell other people they're wonderful, whatever. In other words, it is the actions your customers take that drive your results. You will achieve your best possible outcomes when your customers take actions that help you succeed. Let me share an example with you of how customer actions drive results. Just an anecdote. I know um, on this call we've got wholesale distributors, we've got some contractors, manufacturers. Let me use a distribution example from a parallel industry. I was working with an electrical distributor, so similar to what a lot of you do, but in electrical, in the Massachusetts and Rhode Island area. Granite City Electric, they had about 27 branches, really great company. And one of the first things I did, they, they brought my team in to help them differentiate themselves in the marketplace. And one of the first things we did was we interviewed a lot of their customers. And not surprisingly, what I heard from a lot of customers who started doing these interviews was, yeah, Granite City is good, but you know, the other uh, companies are fine too. So we go to whatever branch is close to whatever job we got that day. So we just spread the business around. That's obviously a challenge if you're in distribution. Well, I got to one customer, maybe the, I don't know, eighth, ninth, tenth customer I interviewed. And this guy said, I love Granite City Electric. I'll, I'll drive by somebody else's branch to go to a Granite City branch. And I had this vision of this guy. Imagine a really cold morning in New England. And he wakes up and he's got a busy day but he's up early because it's so busy and he's in his truck at like 6 a.m. and it's dark and, and you know, the, uh, the breath coming out of his mouth is steaming and his coffee cup, he's got his cup holder in his truck, it's, the steam is just condensing and it's cold and it's dark and he starts driving to go pick up supplies for that day and he drives right by another company's branch and goes another 10 minutes to a Granite City Electric branch. That's the kind of action that drives results. Now, what's interesting when I shared that, that story from the research we did with Granite City Electric's leadership team, the, you know, most of them were high-fiving and saying, hey, this is great. And the president said something right. He said, yeah, but what if more of our customers took actions like that? If more of our customs, customers took that kind of actions, that's when we would really succeed. Because here's the point. You don't control your business results. You don't create them. Your customers do. In that case, that customer is creating great results for them. But think of all the other customers that weren't. Now, when I use the word customer, I want to use it in a very specific way with you. Yes, you've got paying customers. But when you think of this idea that, a, that customer action is a driver of your results, I want you to define a customer this way. Anyone whose actions affect your results, that's a customer. It could be a supplier, a referral source, a partner, a past client, anyone whose actions affect your results. And if you think about it, with what I'm saying here, if you want to reach your best possible outcomes, your key thing you got to do is to motivate your customers to take actions. Sure, you got to control your costs. Of course you do. Sure, you got to make sure your operations are streamlined, of course. But those opportunities for driving results are dwarfed by what happens when you motivate your customers to take actions that help you succeed. Now, I said a moment ago that you can't control those macroeconomic factors, the stock market, Canada's GDP, Canada's unemployment levels, interest rates. You can't control those things. That's macroeconomics. You may have heard of the idea of microeconomics before. Well, microeconomics is the study of how individuals, households, companies, how they behave and make decisions and how they allocate their resources. So, you know, macroeconomics, the big uh, metrics you see on the news that you can't control, microeconomics are the things you can't control. Microeconomics is when you're deciding what restaurant you're gonna order in from tonight, or what kind of apples you're gonna get from the grocery store, or what kind of car you're gonna buy, or when your customers decide to use you. When that electrical contractor drove by one branch and drove another 10 minutes to Granite City Electric at six in the morning. That's a microeconomic decision. And guess what? You can affect the microeconomics. You can't affect those big macroeconomic numbers you see on the news, but you can affect whether your customers make decisions to do business with you versus somebody else. So as bad as the macroeconomy is, 
I'll guarantee you, you got more untapped potential in the micro economy of getting your customers to pay more attention to you and to give you more business. Let's think about how you do that. You first got to ask some important questions about customer action. Who are the customers that can best help you achieve your, your best possible outcomes? It might be different. There might be certain customers. Your customer mix from last year might be a different customer mix from this year. Be open to that. And importantly, what actions do you need to motivate them to take? Remember, customer action is the key driver of your results. So it's pretty important to think about what am I trying to motivate my customers to do? You know, when we think about sales and marketing and branding, they're not like websites and pitch decks. Those are tools. All sales and marketing are, are the things that you do to encourage your customers to act in ways that drive your results because customer action is what drives your results. Okay, so customer action drives your results. Why in the world, why in the world would a customer take actions that help you succeed? And to understand this, let's step back from business for a minute. Think of your friends. You got a friend and he tells you that he really believes in something. He's really committed to it. What's a better indication of what he really believes? What he tells you he believes or what he does? And of course, what he does. You want to know what somebody really thinks and believes? Don't ask them what they think or believe. Watch their behavior. Because beliefs are the spark that drive behaviors. Ralph Waldo Emerson said it really well. He said, the ancestor of every action is a thought. The ancestor of every action is a thought. And when you think about this, I want to bring in the word brand to this conversation right now. You know, I think brand might be one of the most misused words in business. We usually think of branding as something we do to our customers. We put messages out there, we brand them, but that's not how it works. Because you can't brand your customers, you can't tell them what to think. In reality, your brand is not what you say you are, it's what your customers think you are. Your brand is what your customers think you are. So let's think about it. What is it you need your customers to believe? about you, that if they believed it, they'd act in ways that drive your results. You see, your first and most important branding question isn't, what's my logo, or what color Pantone blue are we gonna use? I mean, sure, okay, they're important. But they're not nearly as important as this question. What do I need my customers to believe that if they believed it, they would act in ways that drive our results? What do we need our customers to believe? Think about that for a minute. If you're going to reach your best possible outcomes this year by motivating your customers to give you more business and refer you and tell people you're great and happily pay your prices, what do they need to have going on up here in their brains that would spur them to do that? Well, what I want you to think about is that when you think about what's going to motivate your customers to take those actions, it's not really about you. I mean, who do your customers care about more? You or themselves? Now, I don't need you to give you a lot of time to ponder that question because we all know it. Your customers care more about themselves than you, which means if they're gonna have beliefs about you that motivate them to act in ways that help you, it's gonna be because they believe they are better off. Think about yourself. When you commit to one company or another, either in your business purchasing or on your personal life, it's not just because of them, it's because they believe they're better off. You wanna say this, what do I want my customers to believe? They'll make them say, I am better off because I do business with, insert your company's name there. You know, it's interesting. Here's a really stark anecdote about that. My, um, uh, my, my cousin had to have a liver transplant last year. He's doing great, by the way, now. But when he tells me about how wonderful his surgeons were and how great they were, I know he's not thinking about, oh, they went to this medical school or they have those skills. Sure, that's important. What he's talking about is how they gave him a new lease on life. He loves his surgeons not because of their skills, because they helped them live longer and now live healthy. Your customers commit to you when they believe they are better off because they work with you. This is your main question, branding. What do I want my customers to believe that if they believed it, they would want to work with me, and that belief's got to be about how they are better off working with you. So now I want to get to the 
meaty part of what we want to talk about today, which is, so how in the world do you get people to believe they're better off working with you? And to frame this up, I want to tell you what the worst way to get somebody to believe they're better off working with you is to say, hey, you're going to be better off if you work with me. It doesn't work that way. It's like coming up with somebody you meet and saying, hey, you want to be my friend? You're going to really like being my friend. Of course, you wouldn't do that. You would become their friend and they would believe you're a great friend by you demonstrating great friendship. And the same thing exists here in thinking about how you get people to value your company, to think you're amazing, to think you're better than anybody else, to think they are better off because they work with you. So to illustrate how we communicate with customers in ways that help them believe they're better off, I wanna share with you a metaphor for this. And here it is. This painting is called Sunday After Le Grand Jat. Many of you have seen it, I'm sure. It was painted by a guy named Georges Seurat in Paris in the 1880s. It's a style called pointillism. Seurat, what he did to paint this painting, he didn't just do big brush strokes, he painted lots of little dots. And this painting happens to be hanging about a mile south of me right now at the Art Institute in Chicago, where I am. And I hope you can, if you may have seen it before, if not, come visit Chicago and see this painting. And it's an amazing concept here. What he did was he painted all these little dots. And if you look closely at this painting, what you see are dots. But when you back up from the painting, you see a whole picture. Now, I know this is, we all know this is how TV screens and computer screens work too. He did this long before that. He discovered this principle. Now, why is this in this talk today? Because if you think about how your customers form these powerful, motivating, compelling beliefs they're better off with you it's not just because you promise it in your marketing materials or in your sales conversations it's because you demonstrate it through a completely unified experience imagine if every one of these dots represents a di different interaction a customer has with you let's say if you are a distributor when they look at your website when they come to the counter when they ask you for advice when you help them bring bring materials out to their car, or out to their truck after they buy something. If you're a manufacturer where they call you up for uh, a service call and they use your product, if you're a contractor, when the consumer or the business is actually having you, talking to you about the installation, any everything, all these interactions, if they blend to create one clear picture, it's easier for your customers to understand why they can be better off working with you. I call this concept brand harmony. It's about creating this overall unified brand experience where every single interaction customers have with you blends with every other interaction to tell a complete, clear, compelling story. And when you think about the concept of brand harmony, what you realize is that every single thing you do is marketing. Not because Steve says so, but because that's how your customers evaluate you. You know, it's interesting, I, I had the opportunity um, to work with a, a company in the in the United States in your business, a large distributor uh, covering virtually all of three states in the U.S. Um, and great company, and they did really really well. I had a chance to interview a lot of contractors that they work with, a lot of um, HVAC contractors that they work with. We did some deep interviews with them. This was in the last you know last part of last year, and it was so interesting. Um, this is a good company and their customers really love them. And what I found is when I talked to the contractors, my team and I, we would probe and try to understand why they preferred this company. It was not because just of, you know, outward things like their marketing materials. Sure, it, it registered part of it. It wasn't even just the product. Sure, that was important. What it was, the entire experience of working with them was so well unified. The customers that loved them the most were those that were having this experience of brand harmony where every interaction was part of an overall story, like a mosaic where all the little actions blended together to tell one story. If you can create a unified brand experience, it's easier for your customers to say, I get it. I know why they're wonderful. I wanna work with them. And what they give me, I can't get from the other companies in this business. So let's take a moment. Sadi and I are gonna try something here to do a little poll. I wanna ask you um, on a scale of one to 10, how well are you creating an experience of brand harmony for your customers? Now. One would be complete brand dissonance, an ununified brand experience where every interaction was jumbled. 10 would be like the perfect movie where every scene's there is it, 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 you know, unified with every other scene. We're probably all somewhere in the middle. 
Um, uh, Society's gonna try to do this poll right now. There it is. On a scale of one to 10, how well are you creating an experience of brand harmony of your customers? And you can just mark one to two, three to four, five to six, seven to eight, or nine to 10. Give you a moment to, to uh, take that poll. We'll see what you all think. You know, the higher your score is, the more unified your, your customer experience is. And be really honest, because we all have room for improvement here. Okay, and Sadia will tell us when we get the uh, answers up here. You got it? Be able to display the answers? Okay, so look what we got here. Thank you, Sadia. It worked. Our first time trying to pull here. Um, so 15% of you said three to four, si nearly 60% of you said five to six, and 30% of you said seven to eight, and a few of you said nine to 10. And I'm gonna guess those few that said nine to 10, you're probably more a nine than a 10 because it's really hard to be a 10. But the bottom line is, if you look at this, you're all saying we have room for improvement. And don't be upset with yourself for having that room for improvement. Think about the opportunity. Think about what can happen if you are able to improve your experience. Imagine if you were really a 9.5, wouldn't it be easier for you to get customers to love you? Think about all the, all the noise in your customers' lives. You know, I've looked at this. In the US and Canada, the average person is bombarded with about 5,000 marketing messages every day. Okay, maybe it's a little noisier in the US than Canada, but it's pretty noisy in Canada. Thousands and thousands of marketing messages that are bombarding your customers every day. And for you to cut through the clutter of that, brand harmony does it. You can't shout louder to cut through the clutter of all that other noise, but you certainly can create a more unified experience that helps customers understand you. So thanks, Sadia. We can take the poll down now. Appreciate that. That worked well. Great. So we all have room for improvement. Now, what I want you to think about doing is the following. is How can you convene your team and ask this question? What are the top 10 things we could do to improve our customer experience? I guarantee you have them. In fact, I'll bet if you think of this idea of brand harmony and what it takes to improve your customer experience, I'll bet there are so many things, so much low hanging fruit that costs next to nothing for you to improve your customer experience. So think about it. The, the touch points your customers have with you. What can you do to make this part of the story blend with this part of the story. I've seen often that companies can find things that cost next to nothing, less than $100 to fix. Sure, there's some big ones out there if you decide you need to redo your whole customer experience, but there are probably lots of areas of low-hanging fruit. Think about it. You just rated yourself on that scale. Get with your colleagues and say, where are we able to create a better sense of brand harmony for our customers? Because that's what helps customers believe in us. And to understand why it's so important, think of your own life. Think of the companies you prefer. There might be a small restaurant in your town that you've gone to for years. You've never been to their website. Maybe you've never seen any of their marketing, their marketing materials, but the entire experience of being there, not just the food, the ambiance, the way they greet you, all blends to tell you one clear story. It's brand harmony. And you prefer that restaurant over some national chain that's advertising to you on television. Brand harmony describes how people prefer you. So if you think where we are so far, if you look where my arrow is, we've talked about this customer experience of brand harmony. And that's what helps people have beliefs about you, that they're better off working with you. You have a strong brand, not when you have a nice logo, but when people have beliefs that they're better off working with you. And if they have those beliefs, they will take actions. They will prefer you. They will recommend you. To use my example from Granite Seed Electric, I know you're not all wholesalers here, but they'll drive, translate this idea to you. They'll drive past somebody else's branch to go to you. If you're a manufacturer, they'll ignore somebody else's product and learn about yours. If you're a contractor, they'll call you and not call anybody else. That's what happens when people believe in you. And if they take those actions, you will realize your best possible outcomes. So how do we create an experience of brand harmony? If you think about all the dots in this painting as a metaphor, for your customer experience, 
Who in your company is painting the dots? Just your salespeople? Just your marketing people? Do you have them? Just your technicians? No, it's everybody. Everybody in your company plays a role in creating your unified brand experience. I'll bet you can't think of one person in your company, even if they're behind the scenes, never meet a customer face to face, I'll bet you can't think of one person who doesn't have some effect on the customer experience from behind the scenes, and especially people who are customer facing. So let's talk about how you can inspire your team, whether you have a few employees or a lot of employees, inspire your team to create this experience of brand harmony. What you need your colleagues in your company to do is to be the brand. To at every moment, every time they're doing something, be focused and aware of how what they are doing is helping paint one of those dots, create this experience of brand harmony, communicate to customers through their actions and their delivery why those customers are better off working with you. When your entire team embraces and lives your brand in everything they do, that's when they're being the brand. And that's when you can create this great experience of brand harmony. I mean, I know we've got companies on the call today from a few employees up to many. Let's just, let's say you got 40 employees, okay? Imagine what happens if all those employees are all thinking about how we create a great value for customers, are all aware of what it takes to get customers to love us, and all their actions are working in concert to create brand harmony. That's when you can create an experience that gets customers to believe in you. Now, to, to get your team to be the brand, it's really important that they have beliefs that inspire them to do that. Remember I quoted Ralph Waldo Emerson a few minutes ago? I said, the ancestor of every action is a thought to talk about how customer beliefs and thoughts drive their actions, same thing with your employees. If they have beliefs about your company that are clear, compelling, and powerful, they will take actions to create this wonderful customer experience. I wanna introduce a concept here I call the internal brand. If your brand is not what you say you are, it's what your customers think you are. Your internal brand is what your employees think you are. And a strong inter internal brand happens when everybody in your company has what I call a shared belief of why we matter. When your employees don't just think about the tasks they do, they think about how what you do helps customers succeed. I mean, think about the business you're in. If it's a cold day in the winter and somebody's furnace goes out, no matter whether you're a manufacturer, a wholesale distributor, a contractor, you are all involved in something that matters, getting people to be comfortable in their homes and live their lives comfortably. If your employees are, that's just one example. If your employees, the lens they look at the world through is that what they are doing matters, then you become more than a paycheck to your employees. You inspire their commitment to your company and you inspire their, your, their commitment to your customers. Now, if you look at the graphic we've got here, we worked this model from right to left, our brand harmony results model. The far right, we've got the dollars, the results the best possible outcomes that you want to achieve in this economic downturn. At the far left, we've got employee beliefs. I'm saying something pretty powerful here. I'm saying your ability to thrive in this situation depends on ultimately what your employees believe. Because if they believe in you, they'll take actions that helps customers believe in you. And if customers believe in you, they'll take actions that help you succeed. The connection between your employees, your customers, and results is key to your success. If you re relate that to what we've been saying, we've been saying that your ability to succeed depends on controlling the things you control, and you can control what's on this graphic. You can create an experience for your employees that helps them believe in you, and experiences for your customers that helps them believe in you. So your goal is to adapt to your environment with thoughtful, deliberate, and strategic actions. We talked about things you can't control, and I've shared with you ideas how you can adapt to your control by using this model. And always remember, your success depends on addressing the things you can control. And if you do that, you're gonna succeed. Like I said before, don't wait. Five to 10 years from now, we're gonna read stories about people that did really well and those that didn't. I want you to be one of the companies that does really well. 
don't wait. I know there's a lot of things to worry about right now. You got a lot of incoming fire, but the winners, those are going to succeed, are already taking action here in April of 2020. Don't wait. And if you do that, you will be able to recover before anybody else. And that's going to make a lot of us happy, isn't it? I want to see your business succeed by you sitting in the driver's seat. So thank you. I'm going to take your questions now. And as we do that, I also want to tell you that if you want to get in touch, if you don't get a chance to answer your question now, um, please just send me a note at steve at yastro.com and I'll do my best to, to answer as many of those as possible. So I'll leave that up for a minute while we start taking some questions. So Sadia, do we have any questions? Thank you, Steve. Yes, uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, what should we spend our marketing budget on in an economic downturn? Okay, that's a great question. Where should we spend our marketing budget? Um, you know, it's interesting because one of the challenge, one of the immediate reflexive actions is to cut our marketing budgets. And maybe you should, okay? But maybe you shouldn't. And my answer to this question in any situation, an economic downturn or a strong economy, is that any decisions about what you spend marketing money on should not be based on what we did last year or what we did last month. Like I said earlier, all marketing is the actions that you take to motivate your customers to act in ways that drive your results. So when you look at the model we've, we've worked through today, when you think about what those best possible outcomes are and what you're trying to motivate your customers to do, zero base your marketing spending and your marketing plan and say, what's it gonna take to motivate customers to act in ways that help us realize our goals? Now, of course, you're gonna look at what you've done before and learn from your past experience in marketing, but don't hardwire your marketing budgets up or down based on what you did before. Look at the situation because we are in a new world and say, what's it gonna take us? What's it gonna take to motivate customers to act in ways that drive our results? And base all your marketing planning decisions based on that. This is a wonderful time to start with a clean slate. Yes, learn from what you've done, but say, what's it gonna take to get customers to act in ways that drive our results? That's how you should make that decision. It's a good question, thank you. Okay, I have another question, one moment. Any suggestions on tracking and monitoring success? Great point, great point. Now, um, let's, let's, let's think through our model that we did here. In fact, I'll just go back to it for a second. Um, you know, you start at the right. Next level results. I do recommend that you articulate your best possible outcomes. That's not necessarily a forecast, that's to focus you. Then you can be forecasting to see whether you are achieving those outcomes. And I don't just mean your overall revenue number, break it down by product offering kind of customer and then be constantly measuring how you're doing there. But additionally, you can measure many other things. Look through the model here, customer actions. Define what actions you want your customers to take and see if they're doing those. Look, if you are trying to, if you think one of the actions you need to take is customers doing more online ordering, well then measure, are we getting more online ordering? If you think one of your opportunities is to get more business from your best customers, be measuring, are we getting more business from our best customers? If you're, one of your best possible outcomes is to get more service contracts, then measure, are you getting those things? Customer beliefs. I highly recommend that you be tracking the attitudes and beliefs of your customers. I told you about the research study we did late last year for a wholesale HVAC distributor in the US, and it was fascinating. And what we talked about doing was going back and re-monitoring how their customers think about them. Do that, measure their beliefs now, measure their beliefs going forward. Your customer experience, audit your customer experience. Have people shop you. You know, those of you who gave yourselves, a, let's say a seven on that, that scale or whatever you did, figure out where you're missing it and have people shop you and see if, you're, if, if your experience is improving. Same with employee actions, monitor, are employees doing the right things? Ask your employees what they believe in your company and see if they're believing the right things. So use this model as a way to, to measure your success along the way. Okay, next question. My customers are really distracted because of the current situation. How do I get their attention or should I just leave them alone? Great, great, great point. Your your customers are distracted. This is a really good question here because, um, you know, people are busy right now. People are distracted, of course they are. And it's really easy to raise somebody's hackles with a sales pitch any time, but especially now. So one of the things that I've been recommending to people, and I know I've practiced myself, is the idea of it's okay to serve now, not necessarily sell. Your customers are looking for help. And so what I would encourage all of you to do 
is connect with your customers, connect with your past customers, but in a way that isn't self-serving for you, look for ways to listen to them, hear where they're coming from, and use this as an opportunity for relationship building. Yeah, if a sales opportunity comes up, great, take advantage of it. You know, my, uh, the last book I wrote is a book called Ditch the Pitch. You can probably imagine what it means. It's about selling without a, without a pitch, without a sales pitch. What it teaches you to do, the concept of Ditch the Pitch, is to really listen to the customer and find out where they're coming from. And what I've been doing with a lot of people I do sales training with now is just talking to them about get on the phone with your customers, especially if you can't meet them in person, get in phone or video conference, and listen. Understand where they're coming from and adapt your conversation to where they are today. So be, don't be self-serving. Be in listening mode. Be in what I call input before output mode. Get input from your customer before you decide what you're going to say. I think what you'll find is that many of your customers are interested in talking with you. And if they're not, that's okay. Don't push it. But make sure they know you're there for them and focus on relationship building, not trying to get something from them. Okay, thank you. How do I get my employees to be the brand as most of them are very task oriented and focus more on the technical parts of their job? Great question. That's a really good question because I know you look like, let's see, you've got technicians who work for your company. Um, and they're having customer contact. How do you get them to focus on being the brand? Well, here's what I always like to think about that, is that let's say you have a, a task-oriented technical person or something. I guarantee you when they're out of work and they're with their friends, they're having a good time and building relationships and and have you know being a warm human being. They're great people, right? We just need to invite people to bring their natural human tendency to be good relationship building people and good interactors with other humans into the into the workplace. So I encourage you to do is talk to your employees about what kind of customer experience you're trying to create for your customers. Brainstorm with them. Ask them, what can we do? What can you do to help create a better experience for your customers? When I find that a company is having a hard time with their employees being the brand, almost universally I find it's not the employee's fault is that management hasn't invited them into the conversation about what it takes to be the brand. So I would just suggest have your employees participate with you in conversations about how they can contribute to a better experience for customers, and they will be more willing to be the brand. Another thing I found works really well is if you brainstorm with your employees, you can usually come up with somewhere between five and ten behaviors, we like to call them your company habits, that describe how everybody in the company behaves to deliver a great experience for customers. Brainstorm with your employees about that. And if anybody has any more questions on that, I did flash my email address up there. Happy to, to, to take some questions in writing if you'd like to do that. Okay, last question, Steve. What's the best way to improve brand harmony? That's, that's a good question. And it's um, the answer is there's not one best way. Here's what I encourage you to do. Everybody who put a number up on that screen, from we saw lows of three to four, highs of nine to 10, and most of us in between. What I suggest you do is say, okay, why didn't I give myself a 10? Map out your customer experience from the time people first learn from you, learn about your company, to when they buy from you. Draw it out graphically. What are all the points of contact they have along the way? And I know when you do that, you're going to spot opportunities. Some of you might realize that you're not answering the phone quickly enough. Some of you realize that maybe some of your people aren't able to give good answers to customers. Some of you might find that your salespeople are talking too much or your delivery times aren't good. I don't know what the answer is for you, but I know that if you look at your customer experience, you will identify opportunities to improve that experience. Don't try to improve it all at once. Look at brand harmony less as an on-off switch and more as a dimmer switch. When you start to say, okay, here are the things we could do to improve our customer experience, you start knocking them off one by one, it's like turning the dimmer switch up where the experience gets brighter and brighter as time goes on. Okay, great, thank you, Steve. So this ends our presentation for today. I hope our members found this session informative. Please complete this evaluation survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. And with that, have a great afternoon, everyone. And thanks once again, Steve. Thank you, Sadi, and thanks to everybody who was here today. It was a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope you'll take the ideas for today and use them to help your business thrive in this crazy time we're in. Good luck to okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.